The ultimate evidence of the Holy Spirit in our lives is not signs, miracles, wonders, gifts, tongues, faith, hope, or holiness. The greatest evidence of the presence of the Holy Spirit in us is love. There are three things that will endure, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Love is how the world knows we are followers of Jesus. Love motivates us to minister to the least and the most difficult of these, and in doing so, to serve and love Jesus. Love inspires two great commandments that Jesus gave to us. Love agape, that is selfless, unconditional, and completely giving, is impossible without the help of the Holy Spirit. He pours God's love out of our hearts. For we know how dearly God loves us because He has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with His love. When the Holy Spirit fills us with love, every fear, every worry flees. This is God 321. And now, here's your host, Danny Hutchins. Well, hello. This is God 321, as we talked about. This is our first day, our first day, our first show. I am Dan Hutchins, and now you have my voice. And we are here today with uh, Ron Rickard and his father, Reverend William Tex Rickard. Uh, Reverend Rickard is 89 years old and has served 50 years as United Methodist pastor in Michigan. And I want to introduce you to Ron Rickard, and he's going to talk about his dad and introduce his dad, and we're going to have a great program on humor in the ministry. Mr. Hutchins, uh, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to, to be with you, and I want to introduce you to my father, and my father is my hero. And um, he will be 90 years old in July, and um, the, uh, he was the former district superintendent of the Port Huron District of the United Methodist Church. Uh, he supervised 110 churches in Othelma, Michigan, uh, which we know is God's country uh, up there. And uh, he served churches in Midland, in Saginaw, in Livonia, in East Detroit, and in, in now East Point. And um, the, uh, he was a former, formerly a, um, a trustee of uh, Albion College. And uh, really the best thing about my father uh, was my mother. And uh, my mother was Mary Rickard, and uh, they were married for over 50 years. Uh, my, my mother passed away about uh, when she was 79. But uh, she, uh, uh, they raised six children, um, my two brothers and my three sisters. Um, and um, uh, there were, uh, of those six children, uh, seven of those um, have, uh, or six of those have degrees of seven years or more. In, in what, Ron? Well, we have kind of a strange family, Mr. Hutchins. Uh, the, uh, in our family, uh, you're either a minister or you're a lawyer. And you are? And I am a lawyer. A Christian lawyer? Uh, a Christian lawyer. And the, uh, we, uh, 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 members of our family, uh, both as ministers and as lawyers, have been involved uh, in various uh, Christian causes uh, throughout the United States. Uh, but uh, getting back to my father, my, uh, my father uh, walked the Mackinac Bridge for the last time uh, when he was 80 years old. Um, he was a fast pitch softball uh, pitcher, and pitched a no hitter uh, when he was 70 years old in the Mount Clemens uh, uh, fast pitch uh, church league. You know, I wanted to ask you about that because I had a couple questions. They, uh, people have asked me when I've told them that your dad pitched a no hitter. They asked him, but who did he pitch it to? Were they on the wheelchairs, or you know, were they other 70 years old? Well, uh, let, let me just tell it to you like this: My father could throw a ball that would come to the plate and drop about three feet when it got to the batter. Really? Uh, he could throw a, a curveball that would break at least two feet. Um, and I could tell you, I couldn't hit my dad, and I could barely catch my dad. Uh, the, uh, so I'll tell you, the, uh, uh, it didn't matter who you were. <laughs> he was a tough guy to, yeah. uh, tough guy to hit. That's amazing. Uh, but uh, the other thing about my father is, is that um, when I was growing up in Saginaw, and I was nine years old, uh, there was a very bad plane crash uh, in Saginaw. And everybody on that plane was killed. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, two of the people on, on board uh, were members of my father's church. And uh, their two girls 
uh, who were then 15 and 13, were at the airport to pick up their, their parents. Um, and my father was called uh, to go to the, the airport um, that night. They, they saw the accident? Yes. And, the, um, uh, and later on, my, my mother and my father uh, decided that they were going to adopt those two girls. And uh, they have become a wonderful part of our family, uh, Tilda and Evelyn. Uh, Tilda is a therapist out on Staten Island, and uh, um, she had some interesting times after 911 uh, because a lot of the first responders uh, were uh, from Staten Island. Yes. Uh, and then my sister Evelyn uh, is from Sacramento, a teacher in California. Uh, wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, ladies and, and a great part of our family. Um, but uh, one of the things that uh, my father learned uh, through the ministry is that uh, life isn't always fun and that uh, one of the things that you have to do if you're going to survive is you've got to have a sense, sense of humor. humor. Yeah, yeah. And um, the, uh, so uh, one of the things that, uh, about my father when he was building his church in Saginaw, uh, which was uh, State Street United Methodist Church, uh, it, was a, it was a mission point. And uh, there were very few people uh, when he originally went there, and he was there for 15 years. And one of the things that that, uh, became very evident in the Saginaw community was that uh, that church was going to grow because there were so many people who wanted to come to the church to hear what crazy story my father was going to tell next. And uh, that's not unusual to build a church that way. Uh, For example, the Kensington Church uh, here has grown uh, very, very quickly. Uh, over the years, and one of one of the elements uh, is is humor. It's humor, yeah. Uh, and they they use that on a regular basis. But didn't uh, you tell me or yeah that you know your dad that you tried to play a joke on him? Yeah. Well, the uh, was uh, it you and your brother? Yeah, it was my brother and I. Uh, the uh, <clears throat> my my father uh, was going to give a, a a service on April Fool's Day. And April Fool's Day doesn't come on on April 1st. Uh, the Sunday doesn't come on April 1st very often. And so my brother and I decided that we just could not let this this opportunity go by. So my father had this uh, wonderful uh, uh, habit of right in the middle of the service, he would reach underneath his pulpit, and he would and he would get a glass of water and he would take a drink. So we thought it would be a wonderful opportunity for us to put a couple goldfish in his water. And uh, so uh, my brother and I sat right in the uh, right in the front row. Right in the front row. Right in the front row. You want to see we wanted to see the expression. Yeah, we, we thought, boy, we're finally going to get our dad. So uh, so we waited and we waited and waited. And, and he's getting all the way through his sermon, and he is not reaching for his water. And we are dying. You know, we say, you know, we've gone to all this work. So just at the very end, he gets kind of a little frog in his throat. And he reaches for the water, and he brings it from under the pulpit, and he looks at it. Nobody else could see, but he sees the goldfish. And so, you know, we thought, oh, geez, he's just going to put it back, and nobody will know. Not my dad. My dad just lifts it up so everybody can see it. And he said, look, somebody decided that they would put goldfish in my water, and I think it might be my two boys that are right over here. (laughs) So that was just typical of my father. Uh, it was just really, really tough uh, to get ahead of my dad. Um, now, my father did this um, this service um, called the Healing Power of Humor during um, during Holy Week. He did, and uh, at the Mount Clemens United Methodist Church, just this year. Just this year, and um, and I'd like to just read you a little bit out of the bulletin. Uh, of that healing service. I'd like like to hear that. That would be great. This is what Christians believe about divine healing. Jesus performed miracle acts of healing, healed the sick, cleansed the lepers, and raised the dead. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's a quote from Hebrews 13.8. We believe that Jesus did in the past, he can still do do today. So we have a right to ask for healing and wholeness. But we must remember that God will choose when, how, and if when it comes to healing. 
We don't tell God what he must do. All healing is divine and comes in many forms. Direct, instant, miraculous healing through medical doctors, medicines, nurses, and various therapies. It can be physical, spiritual, mental, or relational. It can be healing by resurrection or in the next life. To receive the healing, you must accept the healer. Healing is a process that is always taking place, and whenever we are open to God, healing takes place because God wants us to be whole. Remember, you cannot study the life of Jesus or the New Testament without noticing the abundance of, record, of records of healing acts. And those, those records of healing are in Matthew, Mark, Acts, Hebrew, St. Luke, St. John, and James. Now, when my dad was doing the research for the, uh, the sermon, one of the things that he talked about was um, some of the articles that, that he had, had come across. And, um, and if, if I could, Mr. Hutchins, I'll just read just a couple of those. Sure. In the 1970s, desperately ill author Norman Norman Cousins found that for every 10 minutes of laughing, he got two hours of pain-free sleep. Since then, one study found that people who just expected to see a funny movie showed a 27% increase in beta endorphins, or pain-relieving hormones, in their bloodstream. According to the Mayo Clinic, laughter's health benefits are no joke. In the short term, laughter can stimulate your organs, relieve stress, and soothe tension and stomach aches. In the long term, laughter may improve your your immune system, relieve pain, and increase personal satisfaction. Now, the... uh, Dad, the uh, one of the things that uh, that you always talked about was the fact that that humor was uh, was something that we always uh, encouraged in our family. And uh, uh, Dad, can you tell uh, tell the, this audience uh, the story about um, the uh, when I was a runner and uh, you were telling me uh, how I could win a uh, how I could run a four minute mile? Well, I suggested that. Uh if he carried a uh, stick of dynamite, he uh, would probably run a little faster. And then, of course, uh, in that same team, there was a guy that uh, wasn't very good on a track team, but he won try everything. And so uh, one day he was trying the, the shot put, and he backed into the guy holding the javelin, set a world record in a broad jump. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, uh, the, uh, recently, my father uh, was on a was on a show with Mitch Album. And uh, and so Mitch asked uh, asked my father. Uh, he said, you know, he said, uh, you know, uh, past he said pastor the uh, uh, I'm I'm having to give more and more uh, um, uh, presentations these days. And he said, could you give me a couple pointers? He said, you've been a minister for a long time. And so uh so my father said, well, Mitch, he said, I always thought a presentation ought to be like a woman's dress. A woman's dress. Yes. And why is that, Dad? Well, it should be long enough to cover the subject and short enough to keep the interest. Okay. So the thing is, is that, you know, no matter where my father goes, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, humor is a big part of what he does. Um, the uh, I, And I'll just uh, give you a, a couple examples of that. Um the last time my father walked the Mackinac Bridge, now it's 4.2 miles. Um, as we began to walk across the bridge, it began to rain. And there were gusts of like 25, 30 miles an hour. So I had to hold my coat as a, as a wind block, have my dad dad's arm next to mine, and we walked across the bridge that way. It was very, very difficult. So we get to the other side of the bridge. We get on the, get on the bus. And one of my father's friends says, well, Tex, how'd it go? He said, oh, it was really tough this year. He said, well, what was the problem? He said, well, this is the last time I'm carrying Ron across the bridge. Okay. Well, <laughs> you, know, you know, again, uh, the, uh, 
um, you know, my my father, um, you know, the, the ministry is, I, I, I think, a very, very difficult uh, thing. And um, I have the greatest respect for pe- people in the ministry. Um, but I think one of the things that keeps their sanity uh, is is humor. And uh, the uh, Mr. Hutchins, you were telling me a story the other day about a... Uh, Just a, call me Dan, uh, Oh, okay. Mr. Dan, the uh, uh, about a, a father and his son uh, oh, walking, walking, the beach? walking down the beach. Oh, yeah, that walking down the beach. And the little boy was uh, was six years old, and his dad and walking down the beach. And they approach a seagull on the beach. And the boy walks up, and he's looking at the seagull. And he looks at his father, and he said, Dad, what happened here? And he says, well, son, this uh, seagull has died. And... But he's he's uh, went to heaven. God took him to heaven, and the boy looks up at his dad and he looks down at the seagull and he said, uh, "But dad, what happened? Did did guy get tired of him and threw him back?" <laughs> <laughs> the um, yeah. my my father. One of the books that he uh, he's read over the years uh, that he really enjoyed was a book called The Prophet. And in the prophet, on page 58, it says, Your pain is the breaking of the shell that encloses your understanding. Uh, Dad, when you were uh, uh, giving your service the other day, you were talking about about how sometimes pain uh, brings you to understanding. Well, first of all, the Life magazine within the last couple of months had a whole uh, uh, major in pain. And uh, what I found is that uh, I've been a minister for a long time, and I've visited uh, uh, hospitals and homes for years. But it wasn't until I uh, had to be there myself and, and I, with a lot of pain, and I found that the pain was a wall that I had to break through, and now I understand. And I have great sympathy, and I'm living with people like that, and uh, have all the the uh, sympathy in the world for him and try to be helpful. Dad, the, uh, uh, you've been in a wheelchair now for about the last year or so. And the um, and what you've told me is that that experience has has, has taught you an awful lot about about how what it's like to live uh, in a wheelchair. Well, that, that's true. I, uh, I was active most all my life, and I enjoyed being able to help other people. And now I'm at the place where I'm in a wheelchair and I can't, can't even get up on myself. And I uh, sometimes uh, get angry with myself. But uh, and, I, and I say, well, uh, I can't do anything. And my family always corrects me. They say, that's not true. It's just you need some help. And I appreciate that. But it's, uh, it's difficult to grow older and your body kind of wears out. And we, that's the way God planned it. And so uh, you just have to learn to live with uh, one thing after another, kind of like buying a used car. One thing breaks down, and another breaks down, and breaks down, and pretty soon you settle. And uh, that's kind of what I've experienced there. But it's a, it's a great place. I learned a lot, and I'm just thankful that I'm there. You know, Dad, uh, one of the things that you did over the years uh, when you were in church was you were always making fun uh, of yourself. And you were talking about the fact that uh, one time, one time, my father said that that um, somebody had a heart attack in church, and they called uh, the ambulance, and they had to wake up fifty people for the, before they found out who actually had the heart attack. <laughs> so that reminds me of that j- joke, you know, with the there's an eight year boy and he's standing in the uh, church hallway and he's looking up at a plaque. He's staring and staring and staring at that plaque. And the pastor comes walking through, and he sees him staring at the plaque. And he walks up, and he says, son, what are you staring at? And he said, I'm staring at this plaque. I'm looking at it. Can you tell me about the plaque? And he said, oh, uh, yes, I can tell you. He said, this plaque is dedicated to those who have uh, died in service. And the boy looks at him and says, which service, Father, the 830 or the 430? The, uh, you know, the uh, uh, one of the one of the things o- o- over the years that um, 
that uh, we did in our family was after dinner, uh, we would play this game called Can You Top This? And, uh, and basically the idea was everybody had to come home with some kind of story. And, uh, and so what would happen is, is that we would begin uh, telling the stories. And, and this was very true with my dad. My dad said that, for example, when the Depression began, he was nine years old. And from 1930 to 1940, he was from 9 to 19. And he said that in his family, he didn't even know the Depression was going on. And the reason was is that so much of what their family did didn't cost any money. I mean, they could tell each other stories, and they'd play baseball, and they would do all kinds of things. Um, But basically what Dad always said was that uh, the game of life is played between your ears. The... um, uh, Dad, the uh, when uh, uh, you first met uh, your wife at Albion College, correct? Yeah, yeah. And then uh, uh, you ended up going to um, to Chicago, right? Uh, to Evanston, right? Uh, the uh, for seminary, right? And then you went to a very small, um, small little church in Wisconsin. Is your first place that that student pastor, right? The uh, and then um, through there, there were a number of things that happened during your ministry that, that were very difficult. Right. And uh, as I recall, uh, when at my father's first church, um, there was a baseball game, Little League baseball game. And uh, very unexpectedly, uh, there was some lightning and, and, uh, that hit the field. And two of the boys on the team were killed. Oh, that's amazing. And um, and the uh, and um, and because of the fact that the boys uh, were not baptized, that there were very few people in the church uh, in in the community uh, that were ministering to that family. And so, you know, here's my dad, a student pastor, um, and uh, the uh, these these families came to my father and said. You know, uh, can you help us? And um, the uh, Dad, you remember that uh, you often said that that uh, the the first thing that people want to know is is how much they how much you care about them. Absolutely, it doesn't matter how much you know; it's a matter of how much you care. I believe that. And uh, and so basically, the uh, you know building the relationships. Uh, was always a, an important thing, and the uh, I, just the fact that my my dad had a sense of humor, the fact that he could throw a baseball uh, faster than most people in the community, and occasionally he'd knock the ball over the fence, uh, was really helpful. Yeah. Uh, and and I think sometimes, uh, you know, um, you know, before somebody will listen to what you have to say, they really want to know. Uh, who you are and whether you're but, like them. Yeah, but your dad, you know, did as Christ is. He walked among them. He was among them. You know, the fact is that Jesus was not a standout, you know. He wasn't a tall man. He wasn't a handsome, rugged man. He didn't have blue eyes. He walked among them. There wasn't a halo that went preceded him. So, But when he spoke, he spoke with authority, and he was part of the people. Can you see... Christ, you know, playing ball, or playing that. You, we know the story when James and John were walking through and they wanted, to, you know, to go to a village and they rejected them and they went, cried out and said, hey, look, I called down the thunder upon him. And I can imagine he's just laughing. He said, hey, come on, kick off your shoes and just and just go on. We're going to a break now. And this is Faith Talk 1500, Dan Hutchins. I'm child behavioral therapist James Lehman. I know you need the Total Transformation Program to turn around your child's behavior, but for some reason you haven't tried it. Maybe you're skeptical and doubt that it will work for you and your child. Listen, I'm willing to give away a 1,000 copies of the Total Transformation to the most skeptical of parents for free. All I need you to do is send me your feedback about how it works for you and your child, and the program will be free. You get the program for free, 
and I get the satisfaction of knowing how the total transformation helped your child. Anyone who says they can change your child's behavior should be willing to prove it. We're going to prove once and for all that the Total Transformation Program works for every behavior problem imaginable, and it'll be free to a thousand of my most skeptical customers. Limited number of free programs available. Call now. 1-800-491-4530. 1-800-491-4530. That's 1-800-491-4530. 1-800-491-4530. This is John MacArthur with another edition of Portraits of Grace. How do you know if you're saved or not? Well, John Calvin, the leading 16th century reformer, established the grounds for your assurance as objective, saying that you should look to the promises of Scripture to gain assurance. Later, reformed theologians recognized that genuine Christians often lacked assurance, so they emphasized the need for practical evidence of salvation in your life. They believed you could gain assurance through subjective means by looking at your attitudes and actions. So who's right? Well, the Bible teaches that both will lead to assurance. And what about your salvation? Ask yourself the objective question. Do I believe what the Bible says about the gospel? If you truly believe, you can be sure you're saved. The subjective question is, is my faith real and is it evident by my life? Ask God to reveal your true condition. God 321. We're here with Reverend uh, Tex Rickard and his son, uh, Ron Rickard, and we want to continue with humor in the ministry. Uh, Danny, I, I just wanted to read you something that my father read at his, his uh, service, and it'll give you an idea about my father's sense of humor. It goes like this How vital is communication? How vital is being on the same wavelength? How vital is understanding each other? Here's how vital. A snowbird from the north wanted a week's vacation at a Florida campground, but was concerned about the accommodations. Uppermost in her mind were the toilet facilities. But she was too proper to write toilets, so she abbreviated bathroom commode to BC and ask in her letter if the the back the campground had its own BC. The campground owner was baffled by this euphemism, so he showed it around, but nobody knew what it meant. Finally, someone said, "Oh, that's simple. BC means Baptist Church." <laughs> She's asking whether whether the campground has its own Baptist Church. So the owner sat down and wrote. Dear Madam, I'm sorry about the delay in answering your letter, but I am pleased to inform you that a BC is located just nine miles north of the campground. It is capable of seating 250 people at one time. I admit it is quite a distance away if you are in the habit of going regularly. But no doubt you will be pleased to know that a great number of people take their lunches along and make a day of it. They usually arrive early and stay late. The last time my wife and I went was six years ago. And it was so crowded, we had to stand up the whole time we were there. It may interest you to know that there is a a supper plan to raise money to buy more seats. They're going to hold it in the basement of the B.C., I would like to say that it pains me greatly not to be able to go more regularly, but it is really not lack of desire on my part. As we grow older, it seems to be more of an effort, especially in cold weather. If you decide to come to our campground, perhaps I would go with you the first time, sit sit with you, and introduce you to all the folks Remember, this is a friendly community. Now, now my father just thinks that's just the funniest thing that was ever written. I, I agree. The, the uh, but, uh, uh, Dad, the um, um, you know when you would give a sermon, uh, you pretty much always would have some kind of story to tell, right? 
I, I try to because it, uh, it kind of uh, wakes them up and uh, uh, so they begin to listen. And if it's funny, they, they keep telling it to other people and themselves and they get the point. The um, dad, uh, uh, do you remember uh, one time we went to the Davis Church, which is just uh, just um, uh, it's up just on Romeo Plank, uh, just north of Mount Clemens. Yes, uh, yeah, I've been there. And um, so, Dad was a minister at the Davis Church. And uh, do you remember uh, uh, telling the people that uh, some of the the uh, the experiences you had uh, uh, in church? And uh, one, for example, you, you told him that that uh, he, had, he had said that uh, he had to have a growth removed, and everybody in the church thought that uh, he had some kind of cancer. Okay, well, well, I, do you remember uh, uh, what that was, Dad? Well, yeah, I said, but don't worry about it, because it's only a haircut. <laughs> now, one time he was given a sermon on um, on things don't aren't always as they seem. And uh, you want to tell the story about the about the two guys on a motorcycle? Well, when I went to um, Butler, Wisconsin, it was a small uh, student appointment, and uh, the second uh, Sunday in October is always a lame Sunday in the Methodist Church. So I was anxious to get somebody to preach the sermon, and it did not very uh, successful. Well, finally, I uh, I got one guy, Manuel Myers, to to do it. And uh, when I got through, he said, oh, God, can I do next Sunday? And he said, I got a whole idea, great idea. And so I said, what is that? And he said, well, two state troopers were riding in a motorbike, and it was cold, and so they stopped to get warm. And um, the guy driving the bike, he said, hey, uh, take your mackinac off and put it on backwards. That's where your uh, your face will be so sore. So cold, and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll turn it off when we get there. So they did that, and they started off, and before very long, they uh, they went head on with a farm truck, and uh, the sheriff was reporting it to headquarters, and he said, well, the guy driving the motorbike uh, was killed all right, but the other guy seemed to be okay until we got his head turned around. <laughs> 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 the uh, um, the uh, uh, in, in just about every story that in, in every sermon that my my father gave, um, there was there was some kind of story and and uh, one of the the things that he used to do talk about all the time uh, were parrot jokes. Parrot jokes. parrot jokes. A parrot like the bird. Yeah, and uh, the uh, um, and. One of the things that uh, that uh, he uh, he was uh, one of the jokes he used to talk about was uh, about the magician, magician, the magician that was on a cruise ship, and the parrot. Yeah, and so uh, the uh, so what was happening was is that uh, as the magician uh, would do his tricks, the parrot would tell everybody in the audience how he did it. He said, "Oh, you know that rabbit's you know underneath the table, you know and." And uh, and so and you know he he would he would hide a coin and he'd say oh he slipped it down his down down his uh, uh, his sleeve. So all of a sudden, the uh, the uh, the car the the, uh, the ship uh, hit an iceberg, and the ship went down. And so it just so happened that the that the uh, magician and the parrot were in the same boat. So finally, the pair looked over at the, the magician and said, okay, I give up. What would you do with the ship? Yeah. <laughs> but the thing is, is that the uh, – um, and, and I tell you, he was, he was yeah, famous. Yeah. He, I think he knew every parrot joke that, that ever was. But uh, – your, your dad specialized in parrot jokes. Yes. And then the, the, the other thing is, is that uh, I told you that he was at the State Street United Methodist Church for 15 years. So they invited him back for the 50th anniversary – of the church. And so they had this wonderful service and they had all these ministers that had served the church there. And, and so then they had a dinner and so they, they were doing the dinner and, um, and they, they got all done. They said, well, you know, we ought to have one last word from pastor Tex. And I said, you don't want to do that. 
Yeah, but they gave him the they gave him the uh, microphone. And Dad, you want to tell him what what you told him? Well, I know I really don't. Want to. <laughs> You know, I told him that I, I I wasn't sure I'd make it to 100. But if I got to 93, I knew what I was going to do. I said, you know, women are out uh, living us for about seven, eight years. So if you're going to get 93, I have a sex change, I can make it to 100. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you, there were probably two or 300 people at that dinner. And um, and there was one lady that was in back, and, and she had kind of a uh, bad problem with her hearing. And, and so she uh, she began to recount what my father had just said. And uh, it was loud enough so everybody heard it. So I leaned over to my father and I said, you know, Dad, I think we have to leave now. <laughs> well, no, you got to tell him what the lady was, was crying out. You told me that. So you got to get animated. What was she saying? What? I said, Martha, yeah, did she... you hear that? <laughs> <laughs> this guy's going to have a sex change operation. <laughs> what a stitch. <laughs> well... <laughs> The, uh, but but again, the uh, um, really the, the the bottom line uh, really is that a lot of a lot of life is very difficult. Yes, it is. And um, and there are many many people that that don't like their lives and they don't like where they're they're going. And they're worried and they're full of fear, particularly today in the economy. I was out the other day with a business friend of mine, and I went in. He owns a a, a company where he has a lot of auditors. So when he sits in his room, he can look out and they see their desk and uh, I can see if they're working and, and, and who's there and who's not there. And we were talking and we got on the subject of, uh, of the resurrection. He says to me, you know, as a business owner, he says, I, I believe in the resurrection and, uh, he says, I, I believe firmly. He said, I, I see, I see witness of that daily. And I said, well, how is that? How is that that you see witness of resurrection daily? He said, well, every day at 4.30, I watch from my office the death rise. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, uh, my, uh. My father, when he when he begins to talk about his his um, uh, his ministry, he's always talking about uh, about you know somebody that that was in his church that uh, wherever they went uh, brought joy uh, and uh, always had uh, uh, something good to say or funny to say or complimentary to say. Um, my father currently is um, at uh, the Sunrise Community in Gross Point. Um, uh, near Nine Mile and Mac, um, and I try to go see my father uh, a couple times a week, and uh, virtually every single person that uh, uh, comes across my father just loves my father, um, and the reason is is that you know he's always saying you know it's just a wonderful day and it's just great to see you and uh, oh by the way this person is is uh, the best person here and 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 just uh, we don't know what we would do without him. Um, well, it's hard, you know, when you live in life and you're whistling and singing, and most people look at you and they, you know, they don't really know what direction you've got. And you know, some people say, "And uh, what is your problem today?" Well, and <laughs> you're not gloomy and grumpy, and how is the economy affecting you? And say, "Well, it doesn't affect me at all." Well, uh, that's your dad. And, and my uh, my father used to say that uh, you you always should uh, should uh, keep a smile on your face because it makes people wonder what you've been up to. <laughs> But uh, the uh, 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 dad, the um, uh, your dad was always the guilty one, though, right? Yeah, well, he could never take the cookie out of the jar without giving away the secret. Yeah. Uh, well, the um, do you remember uh, uh, one of the things that we used to have? Uh, there were a couple of things that were interesting. Uh, uh, many things that were interesting around our our, our table. Um, but one thing was we had a we had a, a jar called the hungry children jar. And each one of us would have a penny at our table plate. And before we could eat, we had to put that into the jar. And when that got filled, we would send it out to, off to missions. And then at the end of the meal, my father would do devotions. And so one day, uh, he uh, do you remember asking uh, 
Uh, my my brother Steve. Yeah, I, I was asking them <clears throat> if they knew any time that uh, Jesus wrote anything, and because uh, I was referring to when he knelt down and wrote with his finger, "He that is without sin cast the first stone." Well, uh, Steve was about uh, three four years old then. He raised his hand. You know, a family of eight, you have to raise your hand to get their attention. And by the way, this guy now graduated from Yale Princeton. But anyway, he raised his hand and said, Well, Steve, you didn't think he knew a darn thing about it. Uh, what, what He said, Well, uh, Jesus wrote a nucky. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah. So, the, really, the, the, um, um, from, from the earliest time that I remember uh, being in, in the household, um, yeah, humor was always important, um, and uh, and and my father was always talking about not taking yourself too seriously. Who was a disciplinarian in your house? Was it mom or dad? Well, or did dad lighten things up even with mom? So he interceded for eight, right? My mother, like many mothers, was in charge of the household, and. Um, and anyone who knows uh, a, a pastor's schedule knows that the pastor's gone a lot. And so the, uh, um, my father's uh, contribution to the discipline of the children was to say, now, children, you need to do exactly, precisely what your mother says, <clears throat> or you will have to face your father's wrath. Okay? Uh, and that was always enough. Um, but the uh, but a lot of times what would happen is when things would get pretty serious, you know, my my father would see some humor in it and and uh, and probably saved our lives more than once. Yeah, I bet. And it brings up an interesting joke. This is a classroom and of eight year olds and teachers trying to teach them between right and wrong, and he wants them to identify some things. So he's, the teacher says, well. If I were to reach in to the back pocket of a gentleman and remove his wallet, who would I be? And one kid said, ooh, 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 I know, his wife. <laughs> <laughs> my, my father used to say that that, uh, that you know, ministers always made the most money. And he said, um, he said, there are lots of people that that make a lot of money per hour, but he said when the minister gets done, it takes four people to pick up all the money. Yeah. <laughs> the uh, another thing uh, that that uh, Dad, do you remember uh, uh, the story about about the two uh, the the couple that was out in the wilderness and they got lost, and they hadn't told anybody where they were going. Well, that's the story of people who were going on one of these uh, mystery trips. Didn't tell anybody, and they just paid their money, and so they go and pick them up, and they were in a small airplane, and they uh, we didn't go too far, and had car tra- or trouble with the airplane, they landed, hit some of the trees, and and hit the ground, and uh, but nobody was hurt, but the plane was wrecked. So they began to think, well, nobody knows where we are, how are they going to get me, or even try to get me. So finally, the fellow said to the his wife, well, did you pay the light bill? Yeah, we paid it. And the gas bill, yeah, did you pay the mortgage? Yeah. But did you pay the church pledge? No. Well, then they'll find us. <laughs> <laughs> Dad used to yeah. talk about the the uh, uh, the two brothers that would come to church every morning uh, on Sunday morning. And <clears throat> they would always get up and leave just before the, the offering. So the minister decided that what he was going to do is he was going to switch the the uh, uh, the order of worship, um, and so there's no way that those those brothers were going to get out without uh, without the, the the plate going by him. So <clears throat> so sure enough, boy, uh, the you know the boy the brothers were really surprised that they you know that, that this was going to be different. He said, "Well, that didn't phase them." He said, "The one guy the one guy fainted, and the other guy carried him out." <laughs> the uh you know the the uh, fi- uh, dad used to tell a story about uh, the the minister that used to come and visit a lady uh in the hospital and so um 
So he called her one day and said, well, I'm going to be doing my rounds. Do you want me to stop by? And she said, no, I don't want you to, to ever come and see me again. And he couldn't understand why. He said, uh, well, did I, have I offended you? Is there some problem? She said, he said no, every time you come to see me, I, I get better, and I'm, and I'm ready to go. <laughs> so please don't <laughs> visit me again. <clears throat> but the... Uh, you know, Danny, the, the, the one thing that I, I would say um, is that uh, th- there are lots of times, and, and it's certainly true with, with me, um, when, when we all just get too serious. Yes, we all need to smile, lighten yeah. up. Well, and, and, uh, the, uh, and, and if, in fact, you don't, you want to remember all of these studies that we, we began talking uh, with that uh, – you know, this can seriously affect your health. Well, we also know that, you know, where there's worry and fear, you know, you you, you are absent of faith. You know, that there's a big correlation with faith. And if your life is filled with worry and your life is filled with fear, God has already told you that he, he, we, we have doubts. We don't give it to him. We take charge of our lives. I know in my own life. You know, with the economy and and being in business, you're worried about your employees, you worry about you know your tenants, you worry about your children, your grandchildren, and then you tend to worry, you tend to have fear. But where is faith? Where is faith? Faith, you know, it it it, it brings you. You need laughter. You need a lightness. You need to give it to God. You know, we read often when we He asked you for your yoke. He wants your yoke. And your joke. Well, you want your yoke and your joke. Well, and the other thing is, is that if it's really the good news of, yeah. of Jesus Christ, yes, it's good it, news. Well, it's good news, and and the thing is, you, you might want to be happy about it. Uh, my uh, another thing that my father quoted was the Healing Through Humor uh, book written by Charles and Francis Hunter. Um, they quote a famous uh, cancer specialist as saying, "One bout of anger." will diminish the efficiency of your immune system for six hours. But one good laugh will increase the efficiency of your immune system for 24 hours. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. So the thing is, is it, it's not just a figment of your imagination. It's not something that, that, oh, you know, it might be a good thing to have a good laugh once in a while. But it's healthy. Um, and the, uh, uh, the subtitle of Dad's uh, sermon was, um, a laugh a day keeps the doctor away. Well, I think it works pretty good. And I was thinking while you were talking about an interesting offering uh, a joke, too. There were three ministers talking together about how they do because they're concerned about their their church offerings and income. So the uh, the Lutheran minister says, well, I, I don't know how to part it. And he said, so what I sort of do is because we have to pay the bills. I have to receive something. So what I do is I draw a circle on the floor. Uh, a big circle, about a three foot, and I throw the offering up in the air. I throw the offering up in the air, and what falls in the circle is God's, and what falls outside the circle, I I, I get to keep. And then the uh, the Baptist says, "Well, you know, I I do something similar to that, but what what I do is I make the circle smaller, and I throw it in the air, and um, I, I get uh, I keep uh, what." Um, uh, is inside the circle, and and the church gets you know what's outside. And the Pentecostal minister said, "Well, you know what I do because I really have a lot of faith. Is I throw the offering up in the air, and what God catches, He gets to keep." <laughs> <laughs> but the uh, um, you know a lot of a lot of humor um, has to do with with uh, the circumstances of things. And the um, uh, and one of the the things that uh, that uh, Dad talked about was um, I, I've just some of the things that just happen in life that that turn out to be very funny. Well, most of the things in life are funnier than anything you can stage or set up or movies that you could do. Life is life is funny and life is tragic. Yeah. You know, and well, the uh, Dad, we're coming to the end of our hour. The uh, and uh, is there uh, a- any last thing you want to say? And and uh, the uh, uh, well, I just say that uh, you, you uh, have to be loving, kindly uh, in your 
humor, and you uh, perhaps you have to be able to laugh at yourself, and uh, don't tell it too many times. <laughs> the, the the big joke in our family is is that the the big problem with Dad's jokes is if anybody ever laughed at his jokes, he thought it was great, so he would just keep repeating them. Yeah. Well, tomorrow. Uh, then I thank you for being here, uh, Ron, and bringing your dad. In fact, I have Reverend William Tex Rickard. Uh, we uh, we will celebrate with you on your birthday, your 90th birthday. And tomorrow we're going to be talking to Caden Stark. Uh, Caden is seven years old, boy, who suffers from extreme severe handicaps brought on about his with his mother, who had uh, taken a a totally cocktail of drugs uh, during uh, his uh, birth, and he was adopted. We're going to talk to his adoptive mother, and he uh, is legally blind. He isn't able to walk independently. He has excessive fluid and water on the brain. He has limited speech, but this kid is so loving. And the family that surround him is so loving. They they treat him as one of them. He has sisters that just treat him loving. And he's going to have a stem cell operation in Japan. And we're going to talk to them about that. And we have a successful young lady. She's a uh, six-year-old girl who's had the surgery. And we're going to be talking with him tomorrow. So this is... God, three, two, one, and thank you for being with us. Thanks for listening to God, three, two, one with Dan Hutchins. God, three, two, one is sponsored by Dihydro Services, Inc. To learn more about the person of the Holy Spirit, visit God, three, two, one dot net. That's God, three, two, one dot net or call five, eight, six, nine, seven, eight, oh, five, four, one. That's 586-978-0541.